Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Katherine Garforth from Garforth Education and today I have the pleasure of being joined by Nikki Parr and we're going to be focusing on handwriting's role in reading development. Uh, so before we get into the topic, why don't you take a little moment to introduce people to who you are and what you do, Nikki? Yeah, thanks, Catherine. It's lovely to join you. It's always nice to sort of have a chat about handwriting and reading and all these good things. So, yes, hello to everybody who's watching. And uh, my name is Nikki Parr. I, um, my background is, is teaching. I see myself as a teacher always and a learner. Um, so I began teaching in 1993 and taught in the classroom and with um, students with additional needs over the next 25 years and um, my background in terms of handwriting really developed through uh, the story of my own son so he's 25 now but uh, when he was three he was diagnosed with dyspraxia now more commonly known as developmental coordination delay and I embarked on a journey as a young teacher at that stage to help him learn to speak, to read and to write because all of these areas were affected. And I was so lucky at that stage to have access to an amazing range of professionals. So it was really through occupational therapists that I developed the knowledge that helped me to help him, but then to go on and support so many children that I taught over subsequent years. So that's essentially my background. And I developed a, a real love of handwriting and helping people feel better about it, seeing the struggles that, that so many children um, met with, with handwriting and the, the method that I used and developed to support my son was something that I found worked consistently with children in my class. Um, so that's kind of the background. And a couple of years ago, I, I, I decided, you know, this is, this is my passion. This is what I want to do. I want to help children, adults, and, but not only them, the, the people that support them, parents and teachers. So the more that I've uh, become involved in that, the more I've learned and the more I, I have to share with people. So handwriting is something that sometimes takes a little bit of a back seat, I find. Uh, so it's great to have the opportunity to talk to you. And thanks for inviting me. Thank you for joining me. I know, I know years ago, I wrote a blog post about the importance of fine motor skills. And, you know, in today's digital world, uh, and in media world, we're not having the same play with our children that we did in previous generations where they have that, uh, you know, the drawing and the coloring and the Play-Doh that's being done on, you know, iPads and computers for a lot of children these days. And that's impacting those fine muscles developing in their hands Absolutely. and yeah. affecting things like pencil grip. And it's not just affecting life, you know, when it comes to printing or cursive writing, we're seeing that, you know, students in medical school and other areas are struggling with some of these fine motor skills that we're needing. Uh, and I also find uh, that many schools, when it's difficult to read handwriting or printing, they very quickly move on to typing and using assistive technology to help the students communicate when really it would be better to spend that time making sure that the student can do the handwriting because it helps in so many other areas. And those are some of the conversations that we're gonna be having today or some of the topics we're gonna to be speaking about. I know in Canada at the moment, a lot of focus is spent on more of the academic side of things and it seems like handwriting kind of takes the back seat and we're not having that same explicit practice of letter formation. Uh, and, you know, it's a little bit in, you know, kindergarten or um, nursery years, you know, when you're first starting school to learn the letter formation. But even then, they're not focusing always on how to form the letters. 
And you'll see various ways of the students holding pencils or their writing utensil and to, to shape the letters. And um, what is your experience with that? Yeah, it's really, I'm always really interested to hear about the experiences in different countries. And um, in the UK, I th- what I've seen similarly, I think, well, as a society, I think there's a sense that maybe we don't need handwriting because we have this di- digital technology. And this is where it's so brilliant that we've got, you know, researchers looking into things because there's great evidence about just how important handwriting is in the process of learning and in reading. Whereas I completely understand why we would have a view that it's, it's just a transcription method. And you'll hear, always hear arguments about how we don't need it because typing is quicker and it's more efficient for communication. But actually there is so much involved in handwriting that affects processes in the brain. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and that's really a, a lot of what I wanted to bring to attention today. I was lucky enough to go to a fantastic conference arranged by the Handwriting Collaborative in January, and just a wealth of, of information there. And, and thankfully, um, things that you can go back to. But somebody who I follow for quite some time is a neuroscientist called Karen James Mm -hmm. and she's done a lot of studies over the last 15 years on um, how handwriting affects the way the brain changes and how it affects early literacy Um, because in the UK what what, what I tend to see when, when, when teachers talk to me about things or I have conversations with people on Twitter they say I often hear Oh, we know we need to do something about handwriting. We know it's, it's, you know it's an issue for us, but we've got to focus on reading and spelling. And, and I think there's an element of, of, of the fact that what we prioritise is very much attached to the things that are formally assessed. So in the UK here, you know, what are OSTA going to be looking at? What's, what's the phonics screening going to show? And really, it's not quite understood yet that handwriting is part of learning to read so neuroscience is showing us this now when um, children uh, you know the foundation of reading of course is letter recognition and this is what Karen James's work has has shown that handwriting prepares the brain for letter recognition in a way that typing keyboarding screen work even C and say so you're going to say to a child you know This is the letter H, say H. That doesn't cause activation in the brain of the the visual cortex. And we're just beginning to understand more through this work that this is so interconnected, this motor movement, the sensory feedback to the brain um, that, that, that then enables the brain to store letters for recognition well the the multimodality nature of it just increases the number of senses that the student is using and it's important to mention that you know written language is just a bunch of arbitrary shapes that don't have any logical meaning to them And, you know, we see this with different alphabets looking different and, you know, characters and that sort of thing. So anything that we can do to help enforce that and recognize it is not like it's a pictograph where it looks like a tree, right? That looks like a tree, so it's a tree. Well, the letter A is a circle and a stick. Uh, And if you put it in different parts and have different lengths and sizes, it's a different letter. So we need to find ways to reinforce that for our students yeah. and type it, like pressing a key on a keyboard. It's the same for all the keys. It's just in a different location. So there is some muscle memory, but it's not reinforcing the shape of the letter and just having that ability to form the letter and say it uh, or the sound that it represents as you're going along helps with 
you know, just cementing it in your brain. Yeah. I think, I think one of the things is it's just so fascinating. I'm, I, I always think I'm just very curious about things and interested. So of course, over my career, I've, I've learned lots of things through experience and observation, but the neuroscience mm. is the thing that makes sense of everything. And at times has corrected my perception and understanding. So I think it's always really important as parents, as, you know, as educators to be open-minded to that and to, to you know, n- not feel bad if there's something that we, we, we thought we understood and then new information comes that, that gives, a, gives a, a different perspective. So the thing that I find fascinating is, you know, modern humans have been around for about 200,000 years mm-hmm. and we've been writing for about 5,000 years. Mm-hmm. So the way that our brains evolved and developed in terms of visual perception was, as you said, um, to recognise objects, faces, places. And that's over thousands of years. So the really interesting thing, and this is this I've learned through the work of Stanislas de Haan, um, was that the and through Karen James's work so this fusiform gyro is part of the visual cortex in young children is uh, bilateral so it activates in both parts of the brain but once we have letter recognition established it's stored in the left hemisphere and it's the the right the right hemisphere it's like that, that ability that was primal in us to recognise faces and objects, that has been pushed out. So the, as the brains evolved to store and recognise letters and words, that part has been has, has taken over. It's recycled part of the left hemisphere and pushed the facial recognition bit to the right. And, you know, this stuff is just fascinating and just this knowledge that this reading circuit is kind of triggered in the brain, but the, the important process of that is, is through handwriting. So the evidence shows in the MRI scans that when you look at a screen, when you just touch a key, as you said, that is not causing the activation and the correlation between some of the motor elements of the brain and the visual. So I think this is the thing, it's, it's, it, it's, sad. it's complex stuff, but it's fascinating. And I think the more that teachers, educators, parents, the more we recognise that handwriting isn't just a transcription, it's part of learning to read, it's, it's part of that foundation, it's really important. If the brain isn't activating through screen work and typing and just say and see then handwriting could be a key factor in helping children develop that letter recognition that is essential to reading development it's as simple as that well and we're seeing the importance of having it in that explicit nature where you're not leaving it to chance and just letting the child figure out how to draw the letter based on an object Mm -hmm. and pairing it at the same time with the phonics and the reading instruction. And the key thing that I think is important to highlight is the need to get this to a level of automaticity so that when they're asked to write a letter, they can do it without thinking. They're not thinking, okay, so I'm supposed to write the letter B. That's that that's a line and a circle, and then the line goes first. And is it B in the air or is it on the ground or that sort of thing? We want it so they they think it and they can write it right away without thinking about it because that's gonna increase the demand on their working memory or the the memory that they have to use uh while they're doing something. And it's like that little mental scratch pad. So if they're spending their efforts trying to remember what the letter works looks like and the muscle movements they need to form the letter, that's going to be very taxing and affect their ability to spell words and 
write sentences, uh, transcribe or taking notes in classrooms. Those are things that we want to make sure that we get right the first time we do it. Uh, because it's very, I'm sure you've trained or retrained many students in letter formation yes. and the, the time it takes to break that habit and the need for it to be one-on-one or a a small group so that you can pay particular attention to what that student is doing as they are forming their letters and providing the correct reinforcement and correction as it's happening in real time. Yes. I mean, you know, when I was class teaching, as I say, a lot that I learned and supported my son with, I brought into my class teaching. Mm -hmm. So you don't have that luxury of Mm -hmm. one-to-one. But what I found was, you know, for me, and I always start with this, it, it all starts with awareness. Mm-hmm. And within a class setting, uh, I, I would look at my children's books, look at their writing, and just pick one letter, one, or either the letter or how they were using the lines to focus on. And the nice thing, you know, in terms of class teaching is that, you know, if you, if you look at one child that needs to work on their formation of A, then look through the books and find everybody else that needs to focus on A. And quite often, a good number of children will need to. And then in terms of drawing their attention and focus to that in the classroom setting, um, even children who might not need to focus on that, they just become more aware of their handwriting. It brings it into consciousness. And a big thing for me in terms of classroom practice is just bringing more conversation and more interest and curiosity uh, because children love it actually. And when you make it small enough and simple enough and you take away emotional pressure. So I never ever, tell students that something is wrong. If, if there's a formation, I think it's, it would be more helpful, clearer. I, I draw them to it with interest. So, you know, it's like, oh, this is interesting. Can you see how that's crashed through that line? Or, mm-hmm. And then draw attention to the, to the model of, of what we want. Because handwriting is hugely emotional. It becomes very emotional for individuals and that can stay with them right through their education and into adulthood. And it's very emotional for parents. So often there can be conflict between parents and teachers because of the perceived pressures and stresses. So there's a whole emotional element to consider as well. Um, But when I work with my, a lot of my one-to-one students, I'm not doing it in real time. Mm. So they will send me examples of their writing and I will, I'm attuned to how they're forming it, and um, I will send them feedback and model mm-hmm. them as well videos. So they always have that. So then, you know, the nice thing is, is that, you know, you can do it in different ways. You can support change in different ways, but it's it, it takes time. It takes time. Yeah, definitely. And um, I guess, why don't we start at the beginning? Okay, when children first begin to learn to print what's the best way for us to approach that i mean there's so many different you know if you look to pinterest or teachers to teachers there's all these various different activities and you know should we work on just lines and circles or loops or do we want to start right away or, or like doing mazes and and that sort of thing if we're looking at whole class instruction where is the best place to start well, as I said, the first place to start is awareness, so mm-hmm. observation. And emergent writing is really important. And that was something that was really revealing to me with Karen James's work. And I think it will be really relevant for people to understand. Because, again, there are lots of... It's very hard for us not to look at things through our adult eyes. Mm-hmm. And... Um, children's perception and their brain development is different the way their brain is functioning and developing is different to our adult brains so um, you might think that it's really important right at the start to for them to be forming particular letters in in the same way 
in the right in the right way or the way that you want to show them but actually what the research is showing is that it's important to let them um, form the letters initially in the way that they perceive them mm-hmm. in that early stage so you can actually do more damage forcing a preliterate child like a four-year-old who's just starting to recognize mm-hmm. and form letters and, and uh, so what, what, what Karen James did in, in this particular study she was referencing was or the many studies that they've done, but she said they would invite um, four-year-olds in and the children that continued, they, 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 were, they were starting to recognise letters, but they only uh, went forward with children who knew less than 50% of their letters. Um, and then they taught they instructed those children with the letters that they didn't know. And then with MRI scanning, looked at the, looked at the activity. And that was evidence of the huge impact that handwriting has, as opposed to typing, keyboarding, C and C. Uh, but what was really revealing was that they need many different models of letters. So certainly in the UK, when I've been into schools, some schools uh, insist on all teachers writing with the same formation that's in their policy, all displays having the same. uh, So even if it's a printed font, matching it to what's in their policy. And, And that would seem logical, wouldn't it? To have one model of a letter. Yes and no. If you're looking at how things happened in reality, it may help with the letter formation, but not with the recognition and understanding of the the cipher or the the letter that they are representing. I know that I do. Hold on, let me get a like when I form my. Uh, let me just find a, a pen. So my letter A. looks like that right okay yeah um and then but you know the schools teach it more like that yes yeah and I remember in my teacher education like when I was doing my practicum the teacher's like oh you can't do your letter your a's like that I'm like well why not well the kids won't know that I'm like well the grades three students I mean that's uh, you know uh is ah, it a and it's like it's something that they should know. And the thing is, she's wanted to know how I formed the letter to see if it was efficient in writing. And, uh, but we need to know what letters look like and have that. I mean, that's the tricky thing with the printed word and, you know, the alphabet is you can have very is different fonts um, and you need to be able to distinguish what letter that represents. And if we're trying to have it, so it all looks exactly the same when they see, you know, a a bubbly font or a a curly one or calligraphy, or even when we start to look into cursive, they're not going to realize the difference and it's going to be harder for them to figure it out. I think it was in Stanislas de Haines book, reading in the brain where it has that sample of, of cursive um, or, or print where the letters are, some of the letters are written in the exact same, but your mind's able to see it, how it's supposed to be and interpret that. So if we're not exposing them to variation in letter formation, then I think that's not helping them. And it also means that this is the perfect A plus, this is what you have to make your letter like, and it doesn't allow for variation, but that's, that's how I see it. Yeah, no. And the evidence is that in terms of that variation that is actually essential, handwritten, seeing a variety of handwritten mm-hmm. formations, it has more impact, has, has impact, whereas at that preliterate stage, print type doesn't. Mm-hmm. Again, it's, it's just, it's that, it's, it's, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's some kind of connection with the handwritten version. And there's, and 
you know, they're very, there's a lot more to research and understand, but these things, you know, this is finding the evidence and then it's about understanding, understanding why. But um, yeah. I think, I think in terms of, uh, I, I do understand why it might seem on the face of it, that the more of a single model you show, the more they'll get it. But it is, it's like that layering, they need to experience that range. And what was also shown was that once they, once children do recognize their letters, then print and handwriting, uh, it's fine. They can, it's just like, once it clicks, then they can recognize it in any kind of font or style, as long as it's got a clear enough formation. <laughs> well, sometimes uh, some uh, chicken scratch uh, isn't always the easiest to read, whether it's, you know, a doctor is a classic example of someone who's not very yeah. clear in their printing. As the daughter of a doctor, I, I completely agree. And it's interesting because currently I have a daughter in that pre-literate stage and just seeing the development of her printing and her letter formation over, you know, from being a four-year-old to just turning five, it's really neat to see how she's doing it and how she's changing it. Now, what are we, what's best practices or is there a best practice for these, um, beginners do we need to have lines on the pages should we be using dots or give them kind of free reign I think you know it's there's, there's obviously with young children there's lots of opportunities for sensory experiences and we need to go from the gross motor to the fine motor it's a it is a gradual process and we're very impatient in the modern world aren't we we want things to happen quickly and you know we, we just do need to learn that patience so it's, it's, a, it's a question of scaling big movements lots of it's, it's in sand or all, all kinds of experiences textures because you know the you need that sensory feedback as well and and then moving to paper I mean I think lines are going to be really important and so it can be fun to introduce maybe just a single line and, and children have an experience of drawing a line down and can they stop and just gradually gradually learning that control and curves um, but as I said the interesting information is that it's important not to interfere with that emergent writing until they've got their letter recognition mm. and then really once that is in place you do mm. want to start to introduce models of formation because if they if they go on for too long with some misformations for example reversals as well um, then those things will become automated now the, the, you know we we now know about neuroplasticity and the fact that we can rewire and change things but if they didn't realize the sooner we the sooner we get things sorted the easier it will be for them long term because as you said once things are automated it frees up working memory to focus on the other things that are in included so I remember an eight-year-old I was working with and um, you know we, we were progressing with his handwriting and then in one exercise I just said to him have you noticed that your threes and uh, I think it was his said were, were reversed and that was actually you know, on a live chat and his face was just like, oh, never noticed, never, he'd never noticed. And his mum said, I never noticed. And I, and I think this is just amazing. We, we're so busy and there's so much going on and, and we, we just don't always notice. So uh, awareness is always key. Now he sorted it out really quickly once he was aware. So um, things can always be changed. But obviously, the, 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 the further we get along the process, the more demands there are in terms of other content in the curriculum. So we really do want to spend these early years and the early stages of, of education getting these skills in and you know, understanding the importance of struggle. You know, if you think every time something is a struggle, there is activity happening in the brain. There is there are new... Um, pathways being formed new connections being made and as you rightly said it, sometimes it can be too easy to think oh they're, they're finding that hard just give them a keyboard 
I'm keyboarding. I'm, you know, a massive fan of technology and keyboarding. It's like, it's, it's fantastic, but it's, it's a separate skill. And unfortunately there's often a perception that, you know, you choose one or the other. Yeah. So um, of course there are time demands, but the thing about handwriting practice, and I learned this very much, you know, my son was later on diagnosed with ADHD um, uh, but he certainly at the age of four, when I started really working with him on on handwriting, um, he couldn't concentrate for, for very long at all. So, you know, the approach was five minutes a day and that five minutes a day might have been helping him to pick up his pen in a, in a, in a, in a way that was going to be useful for writing. So we were talking about a pen hold earlier. And again, that is something that people just often aren't aware of. Um, so uh, the, the, for me, a bit like you were saying with your A's, gone are the days when there is just one right way. So traditionally the tripod grip with three digits on the tool uh, was the right way. And it is a comfortable way of holding a pen or pencil. But I remember being at secondary school and I have a, um, a quadrupod grip with four digits touching. And I remember being really offended. I was kept, clearly a, a teacher had gone on a, um, a training and was t- told that all children needed to have, all students had to have a tripod grip. And I was kept behind mm. to change, even though, I had, even though I had lovely writing and even though it wasn't causing me any discomfort, and, and the main thing is, is that whatever the pen hold is, it, it needs to allow for this distal control, allowing for the movement below the knuckles. And you will see some pen holds, I was showing one yesterday, where, where very unusual pen holds have evolved. And the reason they have it is purely just a way of holding this instrument still to be able to write with it. And it all establishes from, you know, the early, you know, children will always start with a fist grip. Mm -hmm. And then unless somebody notices, you know, some will just be noticing it and picking up and they'll they'll get their tripod grip or their quadrupod grip. And some will just find other ways to hold it and keep it still. And then that becomes established. And again, we need to be keeping an eye on it early on because early on it's not too, you know, you can have fun and games playing and, you know, I kept a, actually kept a log of things that I was doing with uh, my son at that time. Mm-hmm. So, you know, one day's practice might be picking up his, seeing if he could pick up his, how many times he could pick up his pen and sort of make, we had a tick chart and see how many times he could pick it up in a way that was useful. It, it happened relatively quickly, but the older children get, the more emotional it becomes if you try and intercede, if you do it in a way of, um, suggesting that their pen hold is wrong because it's very personal um, I even know of a teacher who um, he has an alternative tripod grip which is quite unusual but it's um, it still allows for distal control uh-huh. Anne Frank held her pencil like this her pen and uh, Taylor Swift holds hers like this <laughs> so it's um so although that's not one I would recommend it does allow uh, you know, and, it, and it's you know you might you might have some sort of, but his his school um wanted him to change it and I think I can understand again that might seem logical because you might think children are going to see that and copy it but you, we need to be able to have conversations with children mm-hmm. and when you've got teacher knowledge and you know why that pen hold is, is fine and you can you can talk to the children about it and say you know I want you to have one that's really comfortable get used to it when you're older um, then then, it, then we can still have that personality that individuality in terms of style so what we don't want is a fixed because when a, when a pen hold is fixed in some way then it's not just the hand that's moving you can't really rest your arm Mm -hmm. use your fingers your hand to do that it's the whole arm and that's why a lot of students get really achy when they have to write a lot 
Mm -hmm. Well, and it, you know, that's something that's artists may use for painting and Mm. drawing, um, but it's not what we want them to be using for their, their handwriting. What would you suggest for students that haven't narrow down to just one grasp for their pencil and then you know they, they shift between a couple different ones um well depending on you know as long as they are comfortable mm-hmm. I, I have different pen holds so I, I actually probably because I, I I model different things I switch between tripod and quadrupod mm-hmm. and when I'm modeling my demonstration videos I have a, a lateral where my thumb comes across because I'm making sure that the uh, the nib of my pen can be seen for formations so I don't think it's anything to worry about too much as long as you know the individual is comfortable so one um teenager I was I've been working with had um an a, a pen hold where he had a thumb tuck so as, as he wrote his thumb was tucked in and when he sent me a little video you could see every now and again his thumb would flick out to release the pressure Mm-hmm. He hadn't realized that. And um, when I showed him, it made sense why it was painful to write. Mm-hmm. And, and so he adjusted and he said sometimes he goes back to it. But as soon as it starts hurting, he switches to, the, to his new hold, which is much more comfortable. Right. It's and then it's more- also the, the pressure that you're holding. Like some people hold it so close to the nib and so tightly and they press so hardly versus others who hold, you know, fairly high up and are very light in their stroke. I mean, it's all right for this natural variation to occur as long as it is efficient and not causing pain. Absolutely, absolutely. And and again, it's conversations and awareness. And, you know, some, uh, uh, somebody might find, think that what they're doing is comfortable because it's familiar, mm-hmm. but actually, it's, it's only with some time and support in terms of changing that they become comfortable with a new alternative grip that is actually, it's only sometimes in hindsight, we can be very resistant to changing things. And again, I think everybody can be very sensitive, children and adults to being made to do something. So a lot of what I do is share stories of people who have helped change and differences made to them. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a, a teacher, I was working with a young teacher who had been, um, he, he was very, he had a, he had a, a very awkward pen hold and mm-hmm. it was putting him off teaching his class because he, he was fearful that he was modelling a bad example. Mm-hmm. But he had been told that his hold was uh, wrong, but they weren't going to do anything about it because... Um, they tried to help someone else and just made everything worse. Mm-hmm. And I can understand that as well. Teachers don't want to make anything worse. So it's really important that there's that, that, that we, we spread this knowledge about how to make changes successfully. Um, because he was, I think, 23 then. And um, once I showed him and told me, you know, you can change it. And this is how, just do a few little bit of practice every day. Um, within three weeks, he was using his new pen hold and he couldn't believe that for these years, all through university, he'd had pain and, and felt self-conscious and would try and hide his grip and hide his writing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yes, I think it's, 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 it can be quite individual. But as you said, you know, sometimes as the adult, if I, if I can see that a pen hold is fixed and I know that's going to be long term, then I help that individual to understand why and and support them on that process of change right now um what about using the little grippies to help improve the the pen hold or the pencil hold when is that appropriate and when should we just put them aside again i can, i would say that's that's on an individual basis yeah. really. so some children will love using those i mean whatever you use so the whole point of that is that um it helps with a consistent hold for the period of change Mm -hmm. because working memory, when children start to think about words they want to use and form their sentences and they will, the brain will just revert to what's automatic. So they won't even notice that they've gone back to Mm -hmm. their former grip. 
Right. So that the, the purpose of it is, is, is to help with the with a with a comfortable hold and to serve as a reminder, a prompt. Right. Now some children love them and some children feel really self-conscious mm-hmm. because their peers aren't using them. So it's not always necessary. Um and I always start without one. Mm-hmm. And only if there is a real need for one, because there's you've then got to have a transition. Once you stop using it, you've got to spend time learn you know learning learning the difference in the feel without it so so it's it's a it's again a process and how important is it to enforce that top down left right formation of the letters I know for efficiency um, matter it's important but what, what do we know about is it really that essential it all depends if you're going to work towards cursive right because the formation so that the letters I use in my resources I try and keep things as simple as possible so the formations you have to although I love all different formations and that's a stage later on once Mm -hmm. children have automated a style then I encourage consideration of you know slight changes and Mm -hmm. to adapt and bring in personality um, but in the earlier stages of becoming really confident and fluent and automating handwriting, the, the, the letter formations that I show are the ones that I found to be simplest to form in terms of clarity and most useful if you want to join. So always print first and printing is the established, you know, it's getting those individual letter formations clear and established. Mm-hmm. And then when... Um, this is something that Karen James is mentioning as well. You know, once once children can print efficiently, if they get to that point, then there shouldn't be a really big issue with learning cursive. And the way that I do that is, you know, moving from single letters to practices where it's just pairs of letters. So again, they just gradually get used to the joins between pairs mm-hmm. of letters and taking those pairs of letters and then applying them in words, just three words. So you get the, and, and then gradually it becomes, is, is, is an, it seems to be a degree of self-teaching that happens once they've got that belief uh, that they can do that. So that's, there are certain letters where I offer um, a couple of alternatives. So with letters like G and Y, I do one that's looped and one that isn't. Because not all letters have, even when you're when you're doing cursive, it doesn't need to be fully cursive. Mm-hmm. Definitely, That's really important. I don't write in fully cursive; I write part cursive. Um, but I, but I I I have learned how to join pairs of letters, so I then choose unconsciously which ones I join and which ones I don't. Definitely. Okay, so now let's move on to the students that are just beginning their phonics instruction, and how do we get writing instructions so it's melding in there and helping with that mapping of the grapheme phoneme correspondence or the letter and the sound relationship yeah well what I do because you know my focus is very much handwriting but inevitably I link that in in ways for some of my students Um, so what I like to do is you know do a handwriting practice and then use that to mark sounds. Mm-hmm. So it's just, again, very simple. And children find it really hard to start with, I think. Mm-hmm. So there's always a model. I do lots of modeling, lots of example, getting them to have that experience of doing that. But it's a great way. I don't see it working as well the other way around. So often handwriting use is can be seen to be used as a tool to practice. Right. Phonics and yeah. But there's just too much load on the brain. Yeah. It's just too much. So do so, you feel that we should be doing printing at the beginning separate from our phonics instruction? Because, you know, a, a very common scope and sequence is starting with the letters S-T-P or S-A-T-P-I-N or SATPIN, right? Well, only a few of those letters have similar shapes in them. So if we're trying to work on letter formation is it better to you know work with letters of similar shapes like you know the tall ones or the curvy ones together 
even though it might be a little bit different than our phonics program. Yeah, I think I think you can have that variety. And I, in turn, again, because I come from a, a handwriting perspective first, mm-hmm. um, I, I, for example, often start with the C-based letters. Mm-hmm. So I go right, even if their C's are okay, and their but their A's are gapping, or I start with the C. Um, yeah, it's, it's a patient process, mm-hmm. one step at a time. But the way that I work is doing four days a week of about five minutes a day. Mm-hmm. So, because the, the 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 issue often for parents and for teachers is like, oh, I can't fit this in. Well, actually, it's really important. And I love a James Clear. Have you heard of James Clear? Mm-hmm. He's got a, a great book called Atomic Habits, which mm-hmm. completely supports the you know the the understanding behind it. Really ties in with the way that I've developed this process and understanding. But one of the things that he says is um, we don't rise to the level of our goals. We mm-hmm. fall to the level of our systems. Okay. So if you can invest some time at the, in the early stages, you know, if you, if you decide this is what you want, not just what you'd like, you want this to be a thing because you understand the benefits, you've got your why, about why it's important. Um, then spend a bit of time investing in the system and the system for me is it's one of the reasons why the company is called Better Handwritten is one, that there are some reasons why things are better handwritten, as we've discussed, you know, the, you know, the, the part of its process in reading, in memory, um, in activating the areas of the brain for creativity. There are many reasons why some things, not everything, but some things are better handwritten, but also the resource library that I've developed, the sheets are handwritten. So there is a model on each, you know, several models on on the sheet of um, handwritten. So that the first step is, is that goes along and ticks a best example. So they are seeing that variation, even on the face of it, it may not look like letters are different, but when they tune in to retraining that visual perception, and uh, yeah, that's that's really important to understand with handwriting. It's not just a motor skill. Of mm-hmm. course, it is a fine motor skill, and that's key. But it is a visual. There's a visual perception. To just write a single letter, children have to um, perceive it, and we can't know how they perceive it. They have to make their own motor plan for how they're going to form it they then have to move their hand and experience all of the sensory information in terms of pressure and paper. And uh, then they've got to use to have the fine motor skill of forming the letter. And there's a lot involved in the process. Mm -hmm. I was hoping that you could take a moment um, to talk about that distal movement that's so r- important in writing. I know a, a lot of people with children will say, oh, but they're so good with Lego. And say, so they must be good with their fine motor skills and not realizing that pinching is a lot different than doing the circles. And so why is that so important to make sure that we have the activities to help with that movement? And what are some great activities that we can do outside of teaching printing to work on those. So, yes, it's, 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 it's something again, that we're not very conscious of. So it, it, it's helpful to really just think about the, the way that we use this, this movement in so much of our lives. It's that it's a really key six, movement for success in, in so many things. Um, yeah, and so the first the first stage is to be aware and to compare different movements and to see how they're involved. So often with, with Lego and things, there's pressure putting things on and pulling things apart, but it's it's not the same movement. Um, so yes, lots of activities like threading, uh, you know, with um, laces and picking up things. Putting, putting buttons, make, there's lots of simple ways. And you can, you can, to be honest, the best thing to do is that is, is, is to Google. You'll get a whole host of, 
you know, lovely suggestions for things to do that are really easy. But it, it's just that awareness and making things fun and, and satisfying. Right. So what would be your best recommendations or best suggestions for how we can make sure that we link our handwriting instruction or our our printing to our reading instruction and our language arts program? Well, the first recommendation is teacher knowledge, parent knowledge. As I said, I hope today just shed a little bit of light on the fact that handwriting is part of the process of learning to read it is not just a separate transcription skill Mm -hmm. so the evidence shows that it's key to developing letter recognition Mm -hmm. and that knowledge I think is the first thing because if we don't believe that if we don't know that if we don't invest in that the chances are with life busy and everything else going on, we won't prioritize it. Mm-hmm. So knowledge first, and then starting making just a very, a commitment to four times a day, four times a day, four times a week to five minutes of something related to this. You know, understanding it's a journey, it's a process and attaching that five minutes to something that you already do to make it a habit. So, for example, you know, you get in from school or and we're going to spend, you know, have a drink. And then we're going to after you've had your drink, we're going to do five minutes. And that was very important for me in terms of my son, because he'd never, you know, he didn't want to do it. So I was often using, a, you know, when we've done this, then you can do that. <laughs> but I was just very consistent and boundaried with it. So it's establishing a habit. So it's the knowledge and then it's investing time in establishing a practice habit. And you need to make that habit in these early stages as easy as possible, because if not, you won't do it. You won't stick with it. Mm -hmm. So it could be to begin with, you just sit down. uh, If we're talking about parents at home and you sit down and you just watch your child, right? and you just you get familiar and notice and be interested and curious and enjoy writing next to them drawing things letting them see you do things so it's just getting that early stages and and then the process is very much about modeling and then trying it and then feeding back and as I say for me because it becomes very emotional very early on you know it's one of the most complex skills that we learn when we're young. And it's one of the first times that there's a huge amount of comparison. Mm -hmm. So children go to school and they have different uh, stages of of brain development and ability. You know, when my son went to school, his his teacher was fantastic. She said, he doesn't, he can't, he just needs to play this year. He's not ready. I'm so grateful for that. And when other children were doing handwriting, he would be taken out and go on the monkey bars in the playground to develop his gross motor skills, his coordination. Um, That can be quite hard sometimes for parents because, you know, parents see the comparison and they want their children to do well. And it can be it can be difficult. You can wish it was different, Um, but you, you need to go from where you are always, not where you wish you would be. So it's establishing a practice habit, taking the pressure off ourselves as parents to always be pushing, you know, so, you know, and, and just being interested and curious, modeling, and of course, um, looking for resources to support that. So um, that's something that that's what I've developed with my work. So I have a, a starter guide that just in, 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 in shows people my process. There's one for parents, there's one for teachers and there's one for self-improvement but showing the process that I go through to decide where to start Mm -hmm. and there's a starter course that helps uh, explain the process for establishing a practice habit and 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 a chance to try out some of the um, sheets and demonstration videos which can then provide a model for people to do the same and and then there's the resource library of people because sometimes it's easier to 
uh, if someone else has done the things, you can just get them ready and then you're ready to go. So you set yourself up for success with a practice process. So different ways, different ways to do it and more than one way to do it. But the process is helping children to become aware, showing them what to do, giving them that chance and understanding that less is more. So practice is very short, quality over quantity. Trust the process. It's a journey. But again, one of the um, things that I see for people where, where things aren't going right, you can get children to write lots and lots and lots. But if everything's not formed correctly, and it, you can be storing up problems because you're automating misformations and misjoins, um, and then they, then they will need to be addressed. And then people think it's too late, mm-hmm. but it's never too late. Do you have any suggestions for classroom teachers when they have a reluctant writer in their class where just getting them to write anything is like pulling teeth? Mm, yeah. And I think trouble the trouble is that sometimes you can feel that reflects on you. But my, my message really is to, you know, you do everything you can to uh, take the pressure off. Mm-hmm. And... Um, because the it is the more you put pressure on, sometimes the more resistance you get. And um, so there's, there's having um, expectations, of course, that there's some engagement, but it's keeping it very limited. So, for example, I started working with a student this week and on the practice sheet, um, he just did the first row of each section. And I didn't say to him, oh, you haven't, done every row you should have done that I I I said that's brilliant I I can see I can see the progress you've made going down the sheet so just helping to just take away that fear and stress in some way I think is essential to start with Mm -hmm. because I've seen children and heard of children who've actually developed like a, a you know a fear of putting their hand on the paper so they didn't used to have this feel, but suddenly it becomes painful to even rest the hand. And really there must be some, there's a, just a resistance because it's just too much. Um, I've also seen children where there's suddenly, you know, you, you cannot go from printing to then just expecting children to join all the time. And sometimes that is an expectation in terms of, in some schools. And, and I've seen examples where children have, um, done their writing and at the end once they once their working memory's got some ability to come back to things they've then gone back and tried to put in the joins afterwards mm-hmm. for fear of having to write it out again or to have to, having to miss a, a break time to rewrite mm-hmm. so I think we, we we have to you know um, be aware as teachers that it's we, we are part of the journey and if we can help them make progress in small steps and then hand the baton over to the next teacher to continue um, rather than trying to get everything done within our time frame. So we've pushed things down earlier and earlier. And as I said, this really important research is showing that it's important for children to, to learn to print and to do that freely in the way that they perceive it initially. And then once they can recognize, once that is locked into their visual cortex, then we can work on the on the formations that are efficient and comfortable and helpful. And, and my, my whole method is about helping people feel better, mm-hmm. whether it's children, whether it's adults, whether it's teachers, whether it's parents, feel better, letter by letter. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me today, Nikki. I've really enjoyed our conversation and mm. I've made sure that I've included links in the chat and on the Facebook live stream of this conversation so people can learn more about better handwriting. Uh, if they're yeah. I've just, one of the things just before we finish, if that's okay, um, I'm really key. I, I'm, I'm very aware that people need to have more conversation, more support, so I am just, um, I'll be announcing it tomorrow, but opening um, some communities, one for parents, one for primary teachers here. So that's teachers up to age 11, one for secondary and one for self-improvement. And so when, when people sign up for the free guide, 
they'll be able to uh, access the community page and come there and ask questions, seek some support. So sounds great. And you are on social media. Yes, I'm, I'm just on Twitter. Um, that's enough for me. At the moment. <laughs> <laughs> but, Wonderful. Yeah. Well, everyone attending, thank you for joining us today and make sure you like and follow Garforth Education to know of upcoming lives. Take care, everybody. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you.